Hello, welcome to 11 Weeks of Android. My name is Sudhi Herle. I lead Android platform security. I'm very sorry we couldn't do Google I.O. this year. I trust you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. Security means different things to different people. For us in the Android team, we look at security as the careful software engineering discipline necessary to keep our users, their devices, and their data safe from accidental or intentional abuse from bad actors. Our security approach is built on three pillars. One, principle of least privilege. Number two, isolation and containment. And three, defense in depth. What does principle of least privilege mean? It means that every component in the system must have the least possible privilege and permission surface for its operation. Isolation containment means that system components and apps must be isolated from each other such that vulnerabilities in one don't end up becoming system-wide exploits. Furthermore, we focus a lot on making sure that any exploits are appropriately contained. In a sense, we work very hard to limit the blast radius. Finally, defense in depth means that we shouldn't rely on a single component in the system to reason about the security of the entire platform. We believe in engineering the platform such that we have multiple defenses to keep our users safe. Android is the most popular and most secure consumer OS in the world today. But this didn't happen all at once. It took us and the ecosystem almost a decade to get to a point where we could have high confidence in the security of the Android devices. What did we do to get here? Let's take a quick look at the past. Many years ago, we brought SC Linux to Android as a fundamental building block for compartmentalization of various apps and services in Android. This has continued to pay dividends in making it difficult to escape the Android security sandbox. To keep our users' data safe, we introduced encryption of the user data partition. We extended this to cover SD cards and invested a lot to make it highly performant. To protect our users' passphrases and key material, we shrunk our data center Titan security chip and added it to Pixel 3. All Pixel devices since then have the security coprocessor that is distinct from the main CPU. We made the underlying APIs available to the ecosystem via the Strongbox How. Recognizing that mobile devices are increasingly the primary compute device for a large majority of our users, we made sure that beginning P TLS is enabled by default for all outbound traffic. We also made sure that all DNS lookups are done over TLS so that rogue access points or middlemen cannot compromise a user's DNS traffic. Also in P, we introduced end-to-end -end encrypted backups for Android. This backup is encrypted with the key derived from the user's primary lock screen credentials or password. What this means is that our users can now fully trust Google with their stored backups because we simply have no way to decrypt them. Only the user owning the backup can decrypt it on their device. We continued our investment in these core security infrastructure through Android Q. We added Adiantum lightweight cryptography for low-end devices so that those users can also enjoy full disk encryption. We believe that security and privacy should be accessible to all devices and all users. Security is a journey, and we try very hard to be disciplined about the things that we add to the platform. We find ways to implement an ounce of prevention rather than struggle to do several pounds of cure. We're very glad today that Android is the most widely adopted and secure personal computing OS. Let's take a look at Android R and what are some key security features we've invested in. Over the past year, we've tried to make Android safe for our users out of the box. Broadly, the work we've done fall into three buckets, hardening, safe by default, and finding new ways to enable new use cases. Hardening the platform um, to increase the cost of exploitation and reducing the impact of vulnerabilities pays dividends over and over again. In addition to the various checks we've added in the kernel and system services, we've also made it difficult to leak persistent identifiers that compromise user privacy. We've significantly expanded coverage of compiler-aided mitigations, such as control flow integrity, bound sanitizer, in sanitizers, et cetera, for several system services and the kernel. 
We've started to look at various places where the platform can adopt a more safe by default stance. For example, we added one-time permissions for location, camera, and microphone. This is a huge win for users' privacy. We've continued to invest in Project Mainline to bring regular security updates of the core platform components to the entire ecosystem. In R, we've expanded coverage of Mainline to include 12 new updatable modules, for example, DNS Resolver, Neural Network API, Wi-Fi Stack, Permissions Controller, etc. We will continue to add more modules into Mainline in the future so that our users and their devices are always up to date and safe. Finally, security is often an invisible feature. We only feel its impact when it fails. This year, we've started to seek opportunities to make security more visible to our users. The platform today is safe enough for us to begin thinking of our everyday experiences and exploring which of those would be easier on a mobile. When you think about building trust around a device's security stance, certifications are a great form of third-party validation. Unfortunately, oftentimes, these certifications fall under what I like to call the three Cs, complexity, cost, and cumbersomeness. For those not familiar with these certifications, Common Criteria Mobile Device Fundamental Protection Profile is the most comprehensive smartphone security certification in the world. It is recognized in 31 countries and it focuses on encryption, integrity, auditability, and control. National Institute of Standards and Technology has a standard called FIPS 140-2. It's an evaluation of the cryptographic modules themselves and is something that US public sector and numerous other regulated verticals insist on having. Finally, the US DOD Security Technology Implementation Guide, or STIG, is a guideline for how to deploy devices on the US Department of Defense network. Using Pixel as a reference implementation, we have been able to really streamline these certifications for our OEM partners. For example, for common criteria in Android 9 and 10, we have addressed a lot of the gaps so an OEM should be able to go through this evaluation without making any custom changes in the platform. For FIPS, in Android 11, Boring Crypto as part of Conscript is now in process for FIPS 140-2. If you're interested in leveraging this, you can piggyback off of our certification for a very small cost, do a rebrand, and get your own certificate. For DISA STIG, in the past, there were different STIGs for different OEMs, but uh, we worked very hard to unify this under a single Android STIG so that OEMs can benefit from not having to go through the STIG all by themselves. To recap, over the last few years, we've been working hard to address the three Cs from our partners, which at the end of the day, I believe, helps all of us and most importantly, our customers. The Safety Net Attestation API is an anti-abuse API that allows app developers to assess the Android device their app is running on. We encourage you to use this API as part of your abuse detection system to help determine whether your servers are interacting with your genuine app running on a genuine Android device. Safety Net Attestation API is used by more than 350 million devices today. We are seeing more than 800 million API calls per day. And last year, we saw over 300 billion uh, API calls. Developers often use Q&A forums on the internet to implement common security constructs, such as file encryption. We've discovered that there is a lot of incorrect cryptographic constructs recommended by the community, many of whom are not cryptography experts. We created the Jetpack Security Library to simplify these common workflows and create opinionated, cryptographically secure constructs for common operations. We're very proud to announce the availability of 1.0 release of our Jetpack Security Library. Already, we're seeing massive adoption of this library by our developer community. More than 6,000 developers are using this today, including major companies. Beginning Android R, developers can use the biometric prompt API to specify the type of authentication that app needs for unlocking or accessing sensitive parts of the app. We will soon add this to Jetpack to make it easy for developers to incorporate biometric prompt into their apps. A big shout out to the Jetpack developers for landing this important library. We're excited to bring identity credential capability to Android. 
This will unlock new use cases such as mobile driver's license, national ID, digital ID, etc. Our Jetpack security library now has the APIs needed for developing identity credential apps. We are working with various government agencies and industry partners to make this happen. The point is, the and Android R is now ready for such digital first identity experience. Let's take a look ahead and see where else we're planning to continue to invest so that we raise the security bar for all Android devices. We've heard loud and clear from all over the world that users have concerns about preloaded software and especially software which has sensitive permissions pre-granted. We're investigating the best way to making the most secure and safe platform for our users. And we're developing ways to reduce some of these risks across the entire ecosystem. A fundamental tenet of any security is transparency. We're investing in a range of technologies that will allow for independent verification of a given system's integrity. One of the major steps will be providing tools and infrastructure to allow Android devices to be verified as being identical to what OEMs ship. This makes it easy to identify supply chain attacks and allow users to feel confident in the integrity of the devices they use. Many of you know about our efforts in certificate transparency. One of the building blocks was Project Trillion. We're partnering with the Trillion team to build a similar public database of system image cryptographic hashes. Finally, uh, we invest a lot of effort in hardening the system. We believe that hardening is a fundamental defense in depth mechanism from increasing use of SE Linux to separate privileged apps uh, to expanding compiler instrumented hardening across kernel and user space. We're collaborating with our ecosystem partners to bring hardware backed hardening via MTE, PAC, and BTI. These newer hardware features available in upcoming SOCs based on the ARM v9 architecture have significant advantages in mitigating common memory related errors and catch them before they become exploits. As long as developers write code, there will be bugs. Across the wider software industry, as much as 70% of the vulnerability reports are directly tied to memory unsafety in traditional C, C++ programs. We've asked ourselves, can we make it difficult to introduce these sorts of common errors? Can we make this entire class of errors go away? We're excited to talk about Rust in Android today. Rust is a relatively new systems programming language that promises to completely eliminate memory safety errors. The language has features in it that make it very hard to write incorrect programs while running as good as or better than equivalent C, C++ code. We believe that over time, Rust will become a game changer for doing deep systems level programming. Rust today is a supported tool chain in Android. And over time, we will continue to invest in Rust and see which system components are better off being written in Rust. We believe that Rust will end up fundamentally making the platform safe for all of our users. Thank you. Thank you.